I think the first speaker now is Joe, now John. This is uh, Luis Canary. We'll talk about the level one crack finding at CMS for the HLS. Yes, I'm here. Can you guys hear me? You can hear me? Yeah, I hear you, Luis. Okay. Yes, okay. we can, you can hear you. Can you try and share yourself? Yes, of course. Do you want me to have video on while I'm talking or not? As, as you wish. <laughs> it's really as you wish. Yeah, I, yes, we're, okay, we're, yeah. Yeah, we're encouraging yeah. that, uh, Luis. Okay. If it doesn't okay. cause bandwidth problems. Yeah, okay. No, I, I hope it'll be okay. Uh, if it seems not, I'll, I'll just kill it. Okay, so let me try and share my screen and see how... Uh, Okay. Is this in full screen now? Yes. Okay. Let yes, me just see good. how to minimize this. Uh, is there a way to... This is all good now. It's all good. You don't see a bar at the top? No. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, all right. So let me go ahead. I'm going to discuss uh, level one track finding at CMS for the high luminosity LHC. So as a brief introduction, um, as I'm sure many here know, the upgrade to the high luminosity LHC is foreseen for uh, 2025 to 2027, and it will significantly increase the instantaneous luminosity of the PP collisions. Um, compared to the design LHC data sets, uh, sorry, the design LHC instantaneous luminosity, we expect something like a factor of 7.5 higher luminosity. And this will allow Atlas and CMS to collect up to integrated luminosities of above 4,000 inverse femtobarm. bomb. And experimentally, uh, this poses extremely challenging conditions. And the upgrade for the CMS detector as part of uh, the preparation for the high lumia LHC operation includes incorporating track reconstruction in the level one trigger. And so what CMS is doing is including full detector track reconstruction operating at a 40 megahertz input rate. Um, and this is really made possible um, using the unique concept of double-sided PT module that I'll mention. Um, and beyond the uh, nominal track reconstruction that we're incorporating, um, we're currently also exploring an extended option, which includes capability to reconstruct displays trajectories from long-wave particles. And so I'll show today the, the latest result from the Evolve CMS level one track finding system. As a brief, brief motivation, these very large uh, high luminosity LAC data sets uh, really enable many exciting physics opportunities. This includes um, doing very precise measurements of Higgs boson properties and couplings, um, in probing the very important Higgs self-coupling through di-Higgs production, um, extending discovery reach in various BSM searches, um, and searching for uh, rare standard model processes that could also be enhanced by beyond standard model physics. And overall, um, these type of physics goals really require us to maintain the ability to trigger on physics at the electroweak scale. But beyond this, uh, we can also probe processes that we have new sensitivity to as a consequence of the upgraded detectors. And so this can include things that are enabled from the inclusion of tracking, such as very um, rare um, B decays, as shown on the bottom left, or uh, possible extensions that we can explore things to, including uh, displays tracking, which I'll come back to. Uh, in terms of the big challenges, the price to pay for this high luminosity is extreme pileup. The plot on the top right shows a simulated event display with an average pileup of 140, um, whereas at the high luminosity LHC, we now expect that something like on average of 200 overlapping PP collisions. And so this is very, very challenging for many of the detector systems, and in particular, it's very challenging for the trigger system. And so for CMS, the inclusion of tracking is really central to mitigating the effects of pileup. And I should say that these numbers can be compared to what we've had um, as an average in, for example, the 2018 running, um, where it was more like around 30 overlapping interactions. Um, and so the, the CMS trigger system is reducing the 40 megahertz collision rate to a data rate that can be read out. For the LHC, the current operation, we have that the first hardware-based trigger, the level one, reduces the rate from uh, 40 megahertz to around 100 kilohertz. For the high luminosity LHC, this is expected to be increased up to a maximum of 750 kilohertz. Um, but we're also including these additional handles in the trigger. And for comparison, without 
the inclusion of tracking, um, the level one output at this high pileup scenarios would really explode. Uh, we're talking about something like four megahertz. So as an overview of the CMS uh, trigger system for high luminosity LHC, um, we have uh, inputs from the different detectors, the calorimeters, muons, and then we have in green, I guess I have a mouse, um, up here, the additional novel handle of tracking at level one. And so this will feed into both what we call a global track trigger, which will perform uh, vertex reconstruction and identify track only based objects, um, and also feed into uh, systems that perform correlations between the tracks and muons, for example, or tracks with um, calorimeter inputs, um, performing even a level one adopted version of particle flow reconstruction. So how tracking actually helps at level one. So first, just to mention that the typical handle that we have for controlling event rates at the trigger level is to increase momentum thresholds. So this is shown on the, in the sketch on the top right here, where typically you increase your threshold, um, you have a lower rate. Um, now, the issue is that um, increasing the thresholds both limits the physics potential, and at some point it's also insufficient. Even if you increase the, the, the threshold, you have accidental um, low momentum particles that are identified as high momentum ones, and so you're not able to really push down the rates as, as you want. And so what the tracking really can provide is an improved uh, momentum measurement from muons. Um, we can do improved identification of electrons, taus, etc. perform track-based isolation, do vertex association for hadronic triggers. Uh, just as an example, on the bottom here is shown on the left, uh, rates comparing um, for an electron trigger if you have uh, with or without adding track information. So the blue here is when you're adding track information compared to the red without track information showing the, the, the big push down in, in rate. Um, and on the right is showing an example of a hadronic trigger looking at the HT variable. Um, if you have only calorimeter information in purple, um, you have a very slow uh, turn on, whereas adding track information really allows you to get a much higher um, efficiency. So how do we actually do this? So the CMS uh, tracker for the high luminosity LHC uh, would be a all silicon based um, tracker with an outer tracker component and a inner tracking part. Um, so this includes having increased granularity to cope with a higher high luminosity LHC occupancies. And as I mentioned, um, the inclusion of performing tracking in the hardware based trigger to identify particles with which transfers momentum above 2 GeV. And so the, the sketch here shows the, um, the outer tracker as it is uh, foreseen. So you have the inner pixel in, in uh, yellow and green, which is not used in the level one uh, trigger. And then the outer tracker in blue and in red uh, with different types of uh, so-called PT modules, which is what is used at level one. So we have a, a central barrel with six layers and then forward disks five forward disks on each side. So to talk a bit more about the, the concept of these PT modules. So these are modules that provide PT discrimination in the front end readout electronics to performing hit correlations between two closely spaced sensors. And these are realized in two dedicated module types, either so-called PS modules or 2S modules. So the PS modules are um, pixel strip modules. So I have a one sensor that are um, thin strips, and then the, the other sensor, the bottom sensor, which is based on um, so-called macro pixels. And this allows to provide a very accurate um, Z coordinate. Um, and it's used in the inner half of the, of the outer tracker. Then the, the 2S modules, the strip strip modules, have um, uh, strip sensors on, on both of the two uh, layers. And so they provide a very uh, fine momentum measurement, but of course, C coordinate. Um, and then based on uh, these uh, PT modules, we define what we call stubs, which are correlated pairs of clusters that are consistent with 
a high PT track. And so specifically on the bottom left here, you have the, the two uh, layers of the sensors, um, a high PT particle, uh, you can compare the, um, the hits in the inner half of the module with the outer half of the module um, for a high momentum particle, such as what's shown here in green versus a low momentum particle in red, which would be rejected. And so using this concept of doing these hit correlations already in the front end electronics allows us to do a data reduction at the trigger readout of a factor of, of um, roughly 10. And then these stubs form the input to the backend track finding. Uh, all right, so uh, the tracking at, at level one at CMS, uh, what we want to do is to reconstruct trajectories of charged particles with PT above two GeV um, at the high luminosity LHC, just for context, we expect something like 7,000 charged particles per bunch crossing, um, but only roughly 200 trajectories with PT above uh, 2 GeV. And so the challenge is for the level one tracking is really to deal with these very large combinatorics. We have something like uh, 15,000 uh, stubs, input stubs to the system per bunch crossing. Um, we have very high data volumes of up to 50 terabits per second. And also in terms of the time that we have at the level one. So for CMS at the high luminosity LHC, the trigger decision has to be made within 12.5 uh, uh, microseconds, which leaves roughly four microseconds for the track finding. Um, and a track trigger operating at a 40 megahertz input rate with this short latency has, has not been built before. And so uh, we utilize extensively different parallel processing in order to tackle this. Um, the CMS level one tracking system is based on a fully FPGA um, based system, um, which is off the shelf hardware and also programmable, which gives a lot of flexibility. Uh, so this shows an example of the system architecture. The other tracker is shown on the, uh, on the left here, and it's divided in uh, in the XY plane into nine phi sectors. And so that's a regional uh, parallelization. And then we also have a uh, parallelization in time, time multiplexing of a factor of 18. And so you have um, the detector readout, uh, which goes through um, the so-called DTC, the data trigger and control boards, which, just, which performs um, pre-processing of, of stubs and and then um, distributes these to the track finding systems. Um, and then the track finding processing boards, um, which uh, is what process one of these non-NANs, which is shown in, in yellow here. And so a new system is then received every 450 nanoseconds because of this factor of 18 time multiplexing. All right, so the algorithm that we are using uh, first, I should note that there are different algorithms that have been explored at CMS for performing level one uh, track finding. Um, this has been presented many times at, at past Connecting the Dots workshops as well. Um, in short, uh, these shown to have uh, similar performance and they've also been demonstrated in hardware as being actually feasible. And this is documented, for example, in the CMS phase two tracker TDR, which is linked here. So what we are pursuing now is a so-called hybrid algorithm, which combines ideas from these legacy algorithms. Um, so it's a road search algorithm, which is based on so-called tracklet seeds, combined with a Kalman filter to identify the best sub candidates and to provide the final track parameters. Uh, okay, so I already mentioned some about the parallelization, but just to say a few more words. Uh, so it's we have this extensive parallelization both in, in space and time. Um, I mentioned that we have uh, these five sectors, but they're not uh, even sort of um, uh, cake pieces or whatever you want to call it, but instead these hourglass shaped sectors. And so what this does is that it prevents tracks um, above a given PT threshold from entering more than one sector. And so you don't have to have cross communication between the neighboring sectors, um, but instead you have to duplicate um, stubs within this yellow region in, in the two sectors. 
um, and, and the critical radius that you can see here defined in the hourglass sector is, is tuned in order to minimize this overlap. Um, but then beyond this initial uh, parallelization, we also do initial uh, additional uh, parallelization within a given sector. And so we divide uh, internally of the algorithm um, these sectors into what we call virtual modules. And this is based on that if you do this finer division, you can simplify the number of combinations that, that you have to consider if you only care about tracks above 2 GeV. And so by doing this, as shown in the sketch here, um, a track above 2 GeV would hit um, uh, some part of a, of a layer here, and then the next, a next layer, whereas a, um, a track below 2 GeV would not be uh, you know, they would occur more, and so you can distinguish these, these cases into uh, minimizing the combinations that you have to uh, consider to minimize combinatorics and also simplify the, the firmware. All right, so a bit more about the algorithm. Uh, what we perform first is uh, seeding and propagation. As we seed by forming so-called tracklets, which is a pair of stubs in two adjacent layers or disks combined with a constraint to the beam spot, um, which also gives the initial track parameters. And only, again, combinations with uh, PT above 2 GV are kept. Um, and then these are projected to other layers and disks, both inwards and outwards, and matched with compatible stubs within predefined windows. Um, and we seed multiple times in order to have redundancy and, and full detector coverage. So currently, this shows them on the bottom here a sketch of the detector and the, the different seeding combinations that are considered. So we have layer one plus layer two, three, four, five, six, et cetera. And so this is really to in, ensure good, good coverage. Um, and as a consequence of this multiple seeding, by construction, the pattern recognition produces uh, duplicate track candidates for a given charged particle. Um, so again, this redundancy ensures high efficiency, but it leads to, to that a given particle can be fine more than once. And we can also have additional duplicates from, from tracks that are formed with uh, combinatorial stubs or very nearby, uh, nearby tracks. Um, and so these duplicates must be removed. And what, how we do this is by merging track candidates that share stubs prior to that they're inputted to the, to the fit. And so currently the algorithm merges tracks that share at least three stubs. Then after this is done, um, these track candidates are forwarded to a common filter. And, and uh, so this is, is uh, iterative track fitting. It uses an, an initial estimate of the track parameters and their uncertainties from the tracklet seed. And then stubs are used to update the, the helix parameters. And again, one of them have to refit the stubs from the seed. Um, and the chi-square um, at these different steps are calculated, and that's used to reject um, false candidates and to reject incorrect stubs on genuine candidates. And this process is repeated until all stubs are, are added. And so the default for the common filter that we use is a four-parameter track fit, but this can also be extended to additionally include the transverse impact parameter D0. So a few uh, examples of expected level one tracking performance based on simulation. Uh, the top left plot shows um, the number of uh, tracks with PT above 2 GV per five sector for TT bar plus, plus 200 pileup. Um, the, uh, the bottom plots show the, the tracking efficiency on the left again in TT bar. So you see in, in black is tracks above 2 GV and in red above 8 GeV. So we have a, um, have a high sort of roughly 95% uh, track finding efficiency across ADA. Um, and uh, the bottom uh, right plot here shows the track Z0 resolution. So either looking at the core of the 68% the in, in black here or the 90% in, in red, which is capturing more of the tails. And so at central ADA, we have, have roughly a millimeter uh, Z0 resolution getting worse as you get to, uh, to higher ADA. Um, and this precise zero resolution is, is really critical for performing the, the vertex association that is so powerful in the trigger. Uh, the other concept that I wanted to mention is displaced tracking. So 
This is not part of our baseline for CMS at the moment, but we're actively exploring an extended tracking setup to include this capability of reconstructed trajectories from long-wave particles. And so how do we do this? Well, first we have to use modified seeding. So for the PROM tracking, we use these tracklets, um, which is two stubs plus the origin. Um, but instead for the displaced, we use triplets. So three um, adjacent layers or disks. And then these display seeds are propagated to either la other layers and disks, similar as for the prompt case to find matching stubs. And then finally, this is combined with a five parameter common filter fit. And so currently what we're exploring is, is these tracklet seed as shown here to have coverage both in the, in the barrel and in the forward region. Um, so in terms of the performance, the bottom left uh, plot here shows the tracking efficiency for a sample of displaced muons um, as function of the transverse input parameter. Sorry about this. Um, um, and the baseline tracking, so the, the prompt tracking is shown in, in black. And so you can see as you get to higher, um, higher impact parameters, it's very, very quickly drops off. Um, Whereas one alternative is that you can foresee just including a, a five parameter fit and that's in green. Whereas if you extend it to the extended tracking where you have these dedicated triplets that remove the constraint to the beam spot, um, you very much recover efficiency also at high, higher D0. Um, and as an example of using this in the triggering, and this has been studied in the context of exotic Higgs boson, Higgs boson decays where you have um, the Higgs decaying to a pair of scalars that in, in turn decays to, um, to jets and where these scalars are, are long lived. And uh, this is studied um, as a function of the, the number of events um, that, that we would have in the detector as a function of the, um, uh, the lifetime. And uh, if you only use the, the standard prompt uh, tracking, uh, you basically have, have very few uh, events identified, whereas if you include the, um, the extended tracking, we can really recover uh, a lot of phase space here. Um, another context in which this is studied is for electrons. So at level one, um, electron tracking is very challenging uh, due to Bremsstrahlung. We don't do something like a Gaussian sum filter um, or similar at level one. This is telling me that I'm uh, running out of time. Okay, thanks. I'll speed up. Uh, uh, right. And so one thing that we see is that displaced tracking may increase efficiency also for electrons. And so here the black is showing the baseline tracking efficiency as function of aid on the left and PT on the on the right. Um, and the, the black is the baseline and the red is the extend. And so you can see that we recover some efficiency with this. And so work is now ongoing to understand the associated additional resources um, and also the impact on, on latency of this. Um, so finally, uh, in terms of how we actually implement this in firmware, this is based on um, many different steps uh, from stub organization to forming tracklets, matching to stubs and doing the fits. Um, and this is implemented in dedicated processing modules and memory module storing data in between the different uh, steps. Um, this is largely based on using Vivado HLS, um, partly also with VHDL, for example, for top level modules and also the Kalman filter. Um, right now we are also doing work on actually demonstrating this in hardware. Um, we've had demonstration performed of the earlier iterations of the level one track finding and we are now um, in the process of doing demonstration of the hybrid algorithm. And so the hardware that we will be using is based on the ATCA platform. Um, so we have the Apollo board um, shown on the left here for the track finding and the Serenity board for the DTC. We also have a picture of our test stand at, at CERN. All right, so to conclude, um, incorporating tracking in the level one trigger is critical for CMS in order to achieve the required event uh, rate reductions. Um, and this is really enabled by the usage of these um, PT modules in the new CMS tracker. Um, and the track finding that we are performing is uh, done with a hybrid algorithm, which combines a road search tracklet algorithm with a common filter fit. 
Um, we're actively exploring an extension um, to include displaced tracking in order to uh, retain feasibility for probing um, physics scenarios with long wave particles. Um, and the um, current, we're also doing a lot of effort on, on, on actually demonstrating this uh, redesigned algorithm in, in hardware. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Louise. We have time for a few questions. Okay, I have one myself. And, I, I raised um, my hand, uh, David. I, I wanted to see. Uh, I wanted to see if you can uh, if you can spot the raise raise my hand button. No, I did not. Okay, no worries. <laughs> uh, very nice, Luis. Uh, really, really appreciate. This was a very. Uh, um, very complete uh, picture of what you're trying to do. Um, what we saw yesterday, yesterday Moritz talked about uh, this uh, uh, hashing approach uh, that uh, that uh, uses some sort of out, like unsupervised hashing technique to find uh, to find buckets. And the test he has shown is that that it works extremely well if you have this sort of directional information which you which you have with your with your stops yeah in on gpus in nanoseconds to find basically uh the the, uh, the uh, everything above uh, one gev because uh, th this is very simplified library so did you try to uh, like find uh, ways to really cut very early down on your complexity because that's i think what you want to do no to Get cut the combinatorics of or the number of of stops uh, very early down to to good candidate chains or however I would call it. Sorry. Yeah. So, so unfortunately, I I couldn't connect yesterday for the talks. I will definitely go through and and look at uh, the ones whenever they're posted because it sounds very interesting. It, in short, I think that the main answer to your question is that the stubs is the, the really the, the first part yeah. which does that for us, right? Uh, that's, right, yeah. We, we, that, that's, if we didn't have the stubs, if you try to just do this based on all hits in the detector, it would yeah. be completely, you will be completely overwhelmed by the combinatorics. So that's the first step that we do. And the second thing is that we rely very extensively on this also internal uh, parallelization, which uh, allows to not only, um, it, you know, for example, if you if you say that this is a, well, I can't even go back to where I had this. No, I, I think I, I understand what you what you're meaning. Yeah, you need to the sec the, uh, the sector logic uh, also is. Yeah, but and and also yeah. within that sector because yeah. by doing by doing a, a clever uh, segmentation, you can reduce already beforehand the number of combinations that you even have to look at because you know that um something here with something here is not going to lead to yeah, something that you have to consider is, so, so those are sort of the, the two of the main yeah. so ways is, that we do this this is what i wanted to allude to the, so what moritz showed uh, yesterday and was also in last year's uh, connecting the dot is this hashing algorithm actually does this automatically for you so you don't have to define the the, the 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 sectors it adapts itself to the data yeah and 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 uh, basically in you have a data structure where this where these close by nearest neighbors that's how it's built on mm -hmm. uh, are grouped together automatically yeah? and that seemed to work extremely well when there was a, a directional information on on the stops so and then there is a super parallel implementation from Facebook, which uh, which he has used, uh, that that does this really really respects that all everything of that runs in parallel. So, okay, I, I think I, I think I need to look at further what was done here to uh, to understand better exactly what you're what you're asking. That sounds very interesting. Okay, one more questions. Uh, now we're looking at uh, raised and uh, uh, well, I have one question on the extended uh, tracking. Mm -hmm. uh, there is less there is less constraint when you're doing this, so doesn't it uh, cost uh, significantly in terms of time and capacity? Uh, 
Great. So, so, so that is what we're exploring now, what the costs really are in terms of both resource, resource usage and latency. Um, and, and the other aspect is that if you start to pick up tracks that don't come from the origin, the majority of those tracks are not going to be um, exciting uh, new physics particles that we magically have all over the place in our detector. Most of them are going to be fake. So there's definitely a trade-off in terms of both um, making sure that you still uh, maintain a good way of identifying prompt uh, good tracks and, and keeping the, the fake rate under control for those displaced tracks and uh, indeed understanding what are the implement, implement implications on the overall system in terms of the, the resources. Okay, thanks a lot. I think we have to move on. All right, I will stop sharing. Thanks a lot, Louise. Yeah, and next is... Uh...